Chapter 9. Are free trade agreements always beneficial? One of the most widely believed policy conclusions of classical economic theory is that free trade among nations is beneficial to all trading nations since free trade always provides more goods and services for residents in all of the free trade nations while fully employing all the productive resources of each trading nation. Accordingly, Classical theory indicates that all import and export markets should be made permanently free of any government regulations and or restrictions such as tariffs or quotas. The conclusion of classical theory is that nations such as the United States will be better off if it would pursue free trade agreements with all other nations on the globe. What is the classical theory basis for such a conclusion? The classical theory analysis produced a law of comparative advantage which it is claimed is a universal applicable truth that assures free trade produces more goods and services globally with resources in every nation fully employed in their most comparative cost, supply side, productive capacity. Each nation will specialize in producing and exporting products from those domestic industries that have a comparative advantage in costs of production. Comparative advantage of a nation's industry is determined by supply-side relationships regarding the productivity of capital and labor in the specific production process used to produce goods and services. In each trading nation any government interference with a free trading relationship between nations following the law of comparative advantage, classical theory claims, will reduce the economic prosperity of the nations involved from reaching their potential optimal production output given its supply of capital and labor. Adam Smith, one however, had a different reason for advocating trade between nations. Smith believed that the ability of any nation to produce additional income and wealth is constrained primarily by the extent of demand in the marketplace and not supply-side comparative cost limitation conditions. By expanding the market for goods, Smith argued, the introduction of trade between nations permitted entrepreneurs in each nation to take advantages of the production economies of scale in their industry thereby producing more from each additional worker employed and thereby enhancing the income and the wealth of the nation. For Adam Smith growth in economic activity was primarily demand driven. The key is the expansion of market demand. An obvious moral of Smith's analysis is that no nation that aspires to be wealthy can be an island into itself. Instead it must expand production via export market demand for the products of an industry that has economies of scale. Implicit in the Smith analogy is that consumers in the domestic market for the products of domestic industries are already satiated with the goods and services produced so that domestic market expansion for domestic produced goods to take advantage of the economies of scale is not possible. In any case, supply cost constraints has no significant role to play in Smith's inquiry into what limits the wealth of nations at any point of time. In 1819 the classical economist David Ricardo developed the concept of the law of comparative advantage to justify the importance of free trade among nations. Since Ricardo, advocates of international free trade have invoked the need for each nation to specialize in the domestic industry, industries, that has a comparative cost advantage in order to increase income and wealth in the face of supply constraints. Unlike Smith's argument, this Ricardian need for industry specialization of each trading nation to increase the wealth of nations does not rely on expanding market demand to be able to capture the economies of scale and domestic production. In a Ricardian world of trade, production in each nation occurs in the realm of diminishing returns where, as we have explained in our earlier chapter, the additional volume of goods produced by hiring an additional worker in a domestic industry is less than the addition to output produced by the previously last worker hired so that costs of production rise with expansion. In Ricardo's scheme increases in aggregate domestic market demand will not, per se, lead to a significant increase in the growth of the wealth of nations, especially in the face of diminishing returns which results in rising production costs per additional unit of output. Rather, an increase in the wealth of trading nations depends on the law of comparative advantage determining the geographical location of industries based on supply-side relative real costs of production and the resulting trade patterns between nations. These real costs are measured in terms of the amount of labor time it takes to produce a unit of output. To explain this classical law of comparative advantage, assume there are two nations A and B and two industries number one and number two and both nations before trade, are producing products from both industry number one and industry number two. The law of comparative advantage states that nation A should specialize solely in production in that industry. Industry number one, 
for which it has the greatest production cost advantage compared to production costs of the same industries number one and number two located in nation b the law then states that nation b should specialize only in production from industry number two where it may have a cost advantage or at least a lesser cost disadvantage relative to industries in nation a this result of nation a's specialization entirely in industry number one production should occur even if nation a also has an absolute production cost advantage in industry number two relative to the costs of industry number two in nation b in other words even if nation a has an absolute cost advantage in both industries compared to the costs of these industries in nation b if nation b has a comparatively smaller cost disadvantage in industry number two than its cost disadvantage in industry number one compared to industries in nation a then nation a should concentrate its resources on production in industry number one producing all that domestic market demands and exporting to nation b all the product of industry number one that the residents of nation b demand in the market nation b should concentrate its resources on production in industry number two where it the smaller cost disadvantage to meet all nation b's domestic demand plus export demand to nation a of other product of industry number two the resulting geographical industry pattern of industry number one is located only in nation a while exporting number one product to nation b and industry number two located only in nation b and exporting number two product to nation according to the law of comparative advantage employing all productive resources in both nations to this industrial geographical pattern will produce more total units of output of number one and number two available for use by all the inhabitants of both nations in the absence of trade if both nations would have factories producing number one and two products while fully employing all their respective productive resources then the total production of number one and number two units will be less than the after trade totals thus with free trade there will be more total products available for the populations of both nations to consume in classical theory analysis both nations gain from free trade as opposed to no trade in ricardo's time a nation's export industry was often associated with a nation's unique supply environment for example, availability of minerals deposits, and or climate difference effects, for example, on agricultural production, that resulted in differences in relative production costs between the nations. This comparative advantage argument for free trade is based on the notion of opening the domestic market to a foreign source which has lower labor time costs of production due to supply productivity advantages not available in the domestic economy. In Ricardo's famous wine cloth example, it was the climate that gave Portugal its absolute as well as its comparative advantage in production cost to Portugal's grapes and wine production. If the labor costs per hour in Portugal was much lower than in England and the mass production of cloth, then Portugal would have an absolute cost advantage in the production of cloth as well as wine. Nevertheless the law of comparative advantage would argue that all the cloth for the market in both countries should be produced in England, while Portugal produced all the wine for both countries since it had the greatest comparative cost advantage in the agricultural production of grapes. Even if the production of both wine and cloth per unit of output was cheaper in Portugal than England, it would be beneficial for Portugal to concentrate its resources into the production of grapes to wine where it had the greatest real labor time cost advantage. Similarly even though it cost more to produce wine and cloth in England, the latter should use its resources in the production of cloth where it had the least cost disadvantage rather than allocating some of its resources to producing grapes for wine where the relative cost disadvantage in England was greater than in Portugal. The result would be greater total production of wine and cloth for the same number of man hours worked in the two nations than if each nation produced both wine and cloth. This total supply increase due to free trade made possible an increase in the quantity of wine and cloth available to consumers in both England and Portugal. In Ricardo's time, agricultural products and minerals were a very large share of total international trade. Divergences in production costs among nations due to climate and the non-random geographical distribution of natural resources were obviously significant. This meant that certain products were relatively cheaper to produce in one country than another. Consequently, Ricardo's law of comparative advantage was largely applicable for explaining free trade patterns between nations that would exist in the 19th century. With the growth of mass production industries in the two centuries since Ricardo, however, mass production manufactured products makes up a larger portion of trade relative to minerals and agriculture than it did during Ricardo's time.
The geographical location of industrial production is often determined on a somewhat different basis than comparative real costs in term of labor time necessary to produce a unit of output in any industry. In mass production manufacturing industries, differences in production costs among nations are not normally reflective of differences due to nature's climatic or mineral endowment associated with nation A visa, vis nation B in mass production industries. The same technology typically is used in production of any particular product at any geographical location on earth. Accordingly, the amount of labor time per unit of manufacturing output is equal anywhere on the globe where a particular manufacturing industry is located. Differences in costs across nations in mass production manufacturing industries are primarily due to differences in the wage and fringe benefits costs per worker in one nation compared to the wages and fringe benefits cost for labor in another nation. Keynes recognized this possibility when he wrote. A considerable degree of international specialization is necessary in a rational world in all cases where it is indicated by wide differences in climate, natural resources, but over an increasingly wide range of industrial products, experience accumulates to prove that most modern mass production processes can be performed in most countries and climates with equal efficiency, too. Today, Given the existence of multinational firms and the ease with which they can transfer technology internationally, any differences in relative costs of production in any particular industry is more likely to reflect national differences in money wages, per hour of labor, plus the costs of providing civilized working conditions such as a safe and healthy environment for workers, limiting the use of child labor, the cost to the enterprise of providing health insurance and pension benefits for employees, etc. Today in any free trade international system, where mass manufacturing and service industries are a significant portion of total trading volume among nations, global industrial trade patterns are more likely to reflect differences in wages, occupational safety and other labor expenses that the enterprise must bear, rather than real costs of production associated with either national differences in climate or difference in the availability of natural resources. In the 21st century, low transportation and or communication costs has made the delivery costs in providing many goods and services to distant foreign markets very low. Consequently, mass production industries that use low-skilled workers, semi-skilled workers, or even, if available, high-skilled workers are likely to locate in those nations where the economic system values human life the lowest at least as measured by the compensation paid per hour of labor and the cost of the work environment provided workers. Long ago most developed nations passed civilizing legislation that made unsafe switch up working conditions and the use of child labor illegal. More recently, enterprises in these developed nations have been made to bear the costs of not dumping pollution into the environment yet such switch up. Low wage and pollution conditions typically still exist in enterprise operating in most less developed nations. Consequently, the promotion of free trade competition among mass production industries favors the location of factories and nations that have little or no civilized regulations preventing switch up conditions, child labor use, wages below some legislative minimum, etc. This means that in developed nations with high paid workers and civilized workplace and pollution controls rules and regulations. Free trade threatens the economic lives and civilized welfare conditions of workers and their families in developed nations. Mass production manufacturing facilities can be outsourced to these nations that still permit what the developed nations believe are uncivilized working and pollution conditions. The result has been that free trade has encouraged profit-seeking multinational enterprises to shut down productive facilities in developed nations such as the United States and outsourcing labor demand to foreign nations contributing to domestic, unemployment problems and wages stagnation or even decline. On the other hand, in those domestic production processes where communication and or transportation costs are very high and immigration legislation limited the importation of cheap labor, for example, personal services such as servants, waiters, barbers, etc., there cannot be any significant free trade foreign competition with domestic places of employment. Significant employment opportunities can still exist in these personal service industries of developed nations even though legislative regulations exist which require working condition standards, minimum wages, etc. Nevertheless, 
If free trade outsourcing displaces a growing number of workers from previously high-paying mass production industries in developed nations, then the competition by displaced manufacturing workers for the remaining existing personal service jobs in non-tradable production processes is likely to depress wages 3 in these activities, or at least prevent the wage of employed workers from rising significantly over time. It is, therefore, no wonder that the share of wages in United States gross domestic product has been declining in recent decades as the United States has engaged in more free trade agreements with nations that continue to have sweatshops manned by low paid workers. As we cross the threshold into the 21st century, Keynes's analytical framework indicated that the argument for complete free international trade as a means of promoting the wealth of all nations and their inhabitants cannot be rationalized on the ubiquitous application of the law of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage may still exist for minerals, agriculture and other industries where productivity is related to climatic conditions or mineral availability. Production in these climate and natural resource related industries, however, are often controlled by the market power of cartels and all producer nations' governmental policies designed to prevent market prices from falling sufficiently to just cover the real costs of production associated with climate or natural resource availability. Those industries for which the law of comparative advantage might still be applicable are often largely sheltered from international competitive forces by cartel or government power. These industries reap monopoly rents over and above a competitive return on their production. In the production of oil, for example, since the 1970s the OPEC cartel has created and maintained a large difference between the market price for crude oil and the costs of producing oil in countries such as Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern nations. Consequently the profits to the OPEC cartel including what economists call monopoly rents has, for decades, been very large. This cartel maintained price was so much greater than the potential cost of producing oil from shale that American and Canadian enterprises had an incentive to find ways to develop the technology for production of oil from shale and still make a significant more than competitive profit at the world price supported by the OPEC cartel. This new competition from shale oil has tended to reduce the cartel's control over price of oil significantly in recent years even though the price may be still much greater than the costs of production from oil wells in countries in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia. 4. The growth of multinational corporations in mass production industries and the movement towards a more liberalized free trading system in the final decades of the 20th century encouraged business enterprises in developed nations to transfer their production technology in order to outsource production, that is, to search for the lowest wage foreign workers available in order to reduce production costs and enhance corporate profits. The availability of outsourcing to cheap foreign labor also acts as a countervailing power to help corporations constrain any rising money wage cost for domestic workers organized by labor unions in developed countries. Indeed in the early years of the 21st century, the rapidly developing industrial structure of many nations, for example, China, India, Southeast Asia, can be largely attributed to the competitive search by multinational firms to utilize low-wage foreign workers to compete with the high-wage workers in developed nations to produce the identical goods and services under the same technological production processes. As suggested earlier, this outsourcing search for cheap foreign labor has created the equivalent of an industrial reserve army of workers in foreign nations that has constrained and sometimes even reduced the wages and living standards of workers in developed nations. In the early decades after the Second World War transportation and communication costs between nations were still significantly large, there was also national government restrictions on trade using tariffs and import quotas. In this environment, labor unions in mass production industries and developed economies could easily obtain increasingly high wages for the unionized workers. This brought about increasingly high domestic unit labor costs in developed nations which acted as a spur to encourage corporate managers to search for innovative domestic investment ways to improve domestic labor productivity and thereby reduce labor costs per unit of output. With the growth of multinationals and the removal of many restrictions on the international trading of mass-produced manufactured goods, High domestic labor costs now are more likely to encourage managerial practices such as outsourcing, rather than encouraging investment and research and development to provide productivity enhancing new technology to lower unit labor production costs. Under current conditions, 
It is often cheaper to outsource using existing technical production processes overseas than incur the higher cost of searching for further technological improvements in production processes to reduce unit production costs in developed nations. Consequently, the larger profits attributable to outsourcing have not been plowed back into as much research and technological development even if, in the long run, it is technological improvements in productivity that provide the basis for raising all living standards. Under the rules of free trade today, there is less of an incentive for managers to pursue innovations to improve domestic labor productivity in any mass production industrial sector as long as inexpensive foreign labor can do the job with the existing technology and transportation, and or communication costs are relatively small. The decline in the rate of growth of domestic labor productivity in many developed nations since the 1970s can be, at least partly, related to this phenomenon of emphasizing the use of cheap foreign labor visa, vis the search for domestic production process improvements by the private sector. Except for production of some minerals and agricultural products, post-Keynesian analysis suggests that justification for the desirability of the expansion of international trade must be justified on the basis of increasing market demand globally. Demand-driven expansion of trade can explain the growth of the wealth of nations in both the Adam Smith sense of exploiting economies of scale and in the sense of John Maynard Keynes who saw the lack of effective market demand as the main reason for the inability of modern economies to provide the full employment of resources income flow that they were capable of providing. Nevertheless, rather than arguing that trade provides the opportunity for all nations to expand the effective market demand for the products they produce. Defenders of free trade policies continually bring out the old chestnut of the classical theory's law of comparative advantage to justify outsourcing production by multinational firms in developed economies. These supporters of outsourcing claim that despite the obvious loss of the high-wage jobs by American mass production workers to lower-wage foreign workers, outsourcing is beneficial to both the United States economy and the rest of the world. They argue that, in the long run, Free trade will result in more income and wealth for all nations by creating new higher value production jobs for workers in the developed nations who are freed from employment and lower value production processes by trade, as well as the creation of jobs in the nations to which production has been outsourced. Unfortunately, the claim that outsourcing and free trade will create new high value jobs in developed nations requires at least two classical assumptions that are not readily applicable to the real world in which we live. First, it is assumed that the hypothesized additional high-value product that will be supplied as workers move from the outsourced production lines to the more, and specified, higher-valued product production automatically will create its own additional global demand for these additional high-valued products. This assertion that additional supply always creates its own additional market demand merely is a reflection of the classical presumption that full employment in a free market always occurs. But as we have already noted Keynes demonstrated that to presume supply increases always creates its own demand increases to assure full employment could not be automatically applied to money using entrepreneurial economies. Full employment is not an automatic outcome of free market competition domestically or internationally. Consequently, if there is anything the elite talking heads and the media should have learned since Keynes, it is that one cannot prove that there will automatically be gains from free trade to be shared by all trading economies unless one can be assured that there is full employment in all nations, before and after free trade. That brings us to a second assumption required to make Ricardo's law of comparative advantage applicable to the real world in which we live. The textbook comparative advantage analysis assumes that the gains from trade occurs only if neither capital nor labor are mobile across national boundaries. If there is no capital or labor mobility across national boundaries, then the capital-rich, developed, nations will specialize in industries that are most productive with a very capital-intensive using technology, while the less developed region that has plenty of labor but little capital specializes in the labor-intensive industries. This trade pattern of comparative advantage will use capital and labor in industries where the technology makes them most productive and therefore, by assumption, the total output globally will be maximized. If capital is internationally mobile, however, and if, after trade, there is not global full employment, then these hypothetical benefits from free trade need not occur. With free international capital mobility and free trade, entrepreneurs will locate capital in the form of technologically advanced plant and equipment investments to produce goods in those nations where it is most profitable to produce, 
that is, where units labor and workshop condition costs are lowest. 5. Thus, if multinational firms can shift technology from nation to nation, then it will take the same number of man hours of input to produce a unit of output in each country, or as Keynes wrote modern mass production processes can be performed in most countries, with equal efficiency.6 than the nation with cheap labor via lower money wage rates and fewer, fringe benefits will have lower unit money labor costs for the production of manufactured items at all relevant ranges of production that the global market can absorb. As long as the underdeveloped nation has an almost unlimited supply of cheap labor, the nation can attract enough foreign capital ultimately to produce all the manufactured goods necessary to meet global demand. In other words, as long as production with the latest technology does not run into significant diminishing returns in total after trade market demand for all produced goods and services is not sufficient to assure global full employment. International production and trade patterns of mass production goods will be determined solely by absolute advantage of having a large supply of low cost workers available. The result will employment and living standards of the higher cost workers in developed nations will decline substantially. The use of the classical comparative advantage analysis is a justification for letting free markets determine outsourcing. Trade and international payments flows can be dangerous to the health of economies of developed nations especially those that restrict the use of child labor, provide their workers with civilized working conditions, and simultaneously provide a high wage standard of living. Such civilized nations will not have any absolute cost advantage in the production of tradable goods and services vis-a-vis -vis nations where sweatshop conditions including low wages prevail. In sum, if capital is mobile internationally, as long as the underdeveloped nations have an absolute labor cost advantage in mass producing all tradable goods because it has available a large additional supply of cheap labor, then the classical theory justification in claiming free trade agreements provides gains from trade for all nations is not applicable. Given abundant available cheap labor supply of unskilled and skilled workers, the less developed nations will attract foreign capital from the OECD nations to employ these workers to produce most, if not all, the tradable goods and services that can be profitably sold globally. The developed nations will be left mainly with employment in industries that produce goods and services that are not tradable across national boundaries. Of course, the proponents of free trade have an almost religious belief that despite the loss of high-wage manufacturing jobs in developed nations due to outsourcing over recent years, the developed nations will develop, yet unspecified, higher skilled jobs in some advanced technology sector. The labor force in countries such as China and India will not have sufficient skills or education to be competitive in this forthcoming new technology high-value product sector. Thus, the often heard comment that, in the long run, Outsourcing is good for the developed economies with high cost labor forces assumes that unemployment will not be a significant problem as new, still unforeseen higher, skilled jobs will miraculously appear in developed nations such as the United States. In his book describing the effect of outsourcing had on American workers at a factory Uchitel 7 found that after two years only one out of three of these displaced workers ended up in a new job earning as much or slightly more than they had at their lost job. The other two-thirds of the displaced workers earned significantly less or were still unemployed. Moreover most of these workers suffered severe damage to their self-esteem and to their mental health. In some cases this led to marriage breakups and other serious personal consequences. Why did not most of these displaced workers find these new high-value jobs that free trade advocates argues must be coming to America? The conventional wisdom is that it is the displaced workers' own fault for their being eligible only for lower paying less value productive jobs. An unemployed worker or a displaced worker needs only to pursue more education and they will always get a better job we are told without a smile on the face of the perpetrator of this innocent fraud. A call for better educated workers as the remedy for workers displaced by outsourcing is a measure of a mind that has not thought through the problems of trade patterns in a freely trading global economy where child labor, and safe working conditions, environmental damaging production, and a host of other factors that are devastating to the progress of a good civilized society. Unless the governments of developed nations take deliberate action to secure and maintain full employment in their domestic economies, 
Free trade has the potential to impoverish a significant portion of the population as unemployment rates in these countries remain high and those workers who are employed are forced to accept a real wage that is closer to being competitive to wages, being paid to the abundant supply of unskilled and skilled workers in cheap foreign labor countries. Surely, politicians and developed nations should be made aware of these potential bad results that can occur from blindly applying the classical theory explanation of the benefits of free trade to today's problem of job outsourcing. Notes A. Smith, An Inquiry into the Wealth of Nations, 1776, reprinted in 1937 by Modern Library, New York. J. M. Keynes, National Self-Sufficiency. 1933, reprinted in the collected writings of John Maynard Keynes, 21, edited by D. Moggridge, Macmillan, London, 1982, page 238. L. Uchatel, The Disposable American, Layoffs and Their Consequences, New York, Knopf, 2006. This possibility was recognized in 1974 in a paper by P. Davidson, L. H. Falk and H. Lee Oil. It's Time Allocation and Project Independence Brookings Papers on Economic Activity, 2, 1974 This paper is reprinted in Inflation, Open Economies, and Resources, The Collected Writings of Paul Davidson, Volume 2 edited by L. Davidson, New York, New York University Press, 1991, the reference to shale is provided on page 331 of the reprint edition. Assuming transportation costs do not completely offset the lower labor costs per unit. Opposite, page 238. L. Uchatel, The Disposable American, Layoffs and Their Consequences, New York, Knopf, 2006.